So this is one of the interesting challenges that you're going to come across at your work, at any production environment, pretty much. The topic is initialization and how do you run those initialization scripts? Okay, so initialization script is something when whenever you deploy a backend service, let's say in our case, it's a Node.js service, and we want to deploy it so that the application actually starts serving some users. But before it does start it, we want to run some kind of an intermediate script. In this case, it's actually a database migration. Meaning, let's say if our database has some tables and one of the tables has many columns and we want to add an extra column, let's say a description, and this column doesn't exist in our database, but it does exist in the schema of our backend service. So every time the app runs or starts, we are going to trigger this migration, which is actually going to do this check with the new column. If the column is not there, it's going to run the migration script to update the actual database. And I have a video on this, so go check it out on exactly database migration so that you know what's going on here. But all I'm trying to say is that there's always a need to do this intermediary or actually a pre-step before our application is actually deployed. Now, there are many ways and some of them are bad, some of them are good, and all of them are fitting different kind of scenarios. So let's learn about them. The first one I'm gonna talk about is a app startup logic. So the app startup logic is pretty much the simplest one and it does fit the simple use cases. So let's say our backend service is being deployed and we're going to run a custom migration script that is actually living within our service. So on startup, we're going to check whether we need to do this migration. If so, then we are going to do this migration. And usually you would use something like SQLize. If you're using Node.js and TypeScript, SQLize CLI perfectly fits it. Again, as I said, I have a video on this, so go check it out. But pretty much you're going to use these commands to basically migrate and check the status and so on. So you get the idea. Now, what are the advantages and pitfalls here? So the good thing is it fits very simple scenarios when you don't have Docker, or maybe you do have Docker, but you don't run a Kubernetes cluster then you don't need to create any of those resources. And it's easy to coordinate. Basically, your app is also responsible for the migration. So it's everything living within one service. Now, the thing is, it's not ideal for multi deployments, meaning if you have auto scaling, and this is, let's say one of your EC2 instances. And if you're on AWS, you're going to automatically spin up a second one. Now, if one of those apps restarts, it's going to do the same migration again. And you know, you can kind of run into race conditions or have unnecessary migration steps. So you actually need to add some custom logic, for example, to, so it's called mutex logic to prevent concurrent runs. For example, you can achieve this by introducing another table called migrations log, where every time an instance starts or your application starts, it's going to try to acquire a lock. So going to check this table and say, see if there's a lock on this. If not, then one of the instances is going to carry out the migration script and another one is not. But this is very error prone and it's usually only recommended for very simple cases and not for big ones. So let's take a look. We basically have a Docker file as you saw. Docker file as usually tries to trigger the entry point SH and before we actually do npm run start to start our service, we're simply going to run npm run migrate. And migrate is, I'm kind of imitating the locking because yeah, it was a different type of code. And I'm simply trying to write into a file and read from the file. So you get the idea, you basically need to implement this kind of a table. Now, going away from this example, we're going to see that we have a bit of a more advanced way of handling this, which is called init containers. Now init containers are native to Kubernetes. And as you already know, if you're working especially with microservices or in a, some kind of a sophisticated environment, most of the people or most of the teams are going to be using Docker and Kubernetes. So this is pretty much the default. And this is why this is the direction that I'm going to. And I think this is the right way. Anyways, in Kubernetes, you have init containers and init containers are basically running within the same pod. So this thing that you see here, this box, 
is basically only one pod. And as you know, one pod can carry multiple containers. And in this case, we're going to have an init container running next to our backend service. And you can have as many init containers as you want. So let's say you even had another init container here and all of them are actually going to run in a sequence. So this init container is not going to run unless this init container finishes. And in this case, this init container is simply going to run the migration. And as soon as it's done, our backend service is going to finally start. How cool is that? Now, init containers are quite flexible, meaning they're reusable. You can literally define your init container. And by the way, you can go through the documentation if you're interested. I'm just going to leave the link in the description. But init containers basically have their own Docker image. As you can see here, it's basically its own container. So you can build one image and distribute it, in, it into different pods. So the advantages is that we have a separation of concerns, meaning our migration script is not going to live within our service. Our service is solely responsible for serving our clients, obviously. Also, we have a guaranteed sequence, which is good because init container is not going to start the backend service unless it finishes. This is usually what we want. And we also have reusability, as I said, because you can put this init container into any different pod. Now, well, some of the pitfalls are that it's pretty much has the same issues as the app startup logic, meaning we still have not gotten away from this issue where multiple migrations are going to run. Also, there's no global coordination across different pods and services, meaning the Kubernetes cluster is actually not fully aware of this init container because it's running within the pod and other pods are not able to have access to this init container or even check its status, whether the init container has been finished and our backend service, whether it's ready or not. So this is probably not ideal for sophisticated environments. Also, it's not suited for long lived tasks because if the init container takes minutes, our pod is not going to start. Now, we'll probably face it in any case, this issue is permanent, but at least in our next option, we're going to be able to have at least some control over the timing here. Now let's take a look at the code so that we know what it looks like. So in a container demo, and we have a Docker file, we're going to start the file. Um, but we also see that we have a KAS YAML. This is the Kubernetes file. And we see that we have a pod declaration. And in our pod, we have init containers and the init container is called migrate. So this init container is going to run first. And then one of our containers, which is our backend service is going to run next. So this one is not going to run unless this one finishes. Okay. So now we're aware of these two issues or these two options that you can go for. Now the perfect one, but honestly, this is probably better for already applications that are serving millions of users. And this one are probably okay for applications that serve hundreds of users or your pet project. This is also fine for most of the cases. But the Kubernetes job is what you need to be what you need to have to be resilient. So let's take a look. A Kubernetes job is a different beast. It's not a pod. And it's not a, it's it's not a deployment. It's literally a job. And this is how I'm going to show you, you have to declare it. And it's basically going to have its own job pod. Can you call it a job pod? I believe so. A job pod. And within this pod, we're going to have our container running separately. Okay. So every time this job has finished, similarly to init containers, it's going to or not finish, but first of all, obviously, it's going to run the migration. And after the migration has finished, we're going to be able to start the service. Now, the cool thing here is that you can actually define multiple services. So it doesn't have to be the back backend service. It can be, I don't know, tens of others services, and they all can be waiting for this migration job to finish. Okay, this makes it even more reusable than init containers. Now let's take a look at the advantages. So jobs are designed to run exactly once across the entire cluster, meaning other entities of the Kubernetes cluster are actually aware of these jobs. As I said, services can be aware of it and other 
deployments or pods can be aware of it. And you can also define a number of completions if you want. And also they can run before the deployments with Helm or CD, CI CD orchestration. So the thing is Kubernetes on itself, it's a, is a bit dumb when it comes to jobs and sequencing them. So if you just declare a job and don't do, don't add some hooks with Helm, your applications are going to have a hard time actually waiting for this job to finish. So I'm going to show you a trick that you can use to actually overcome this. Another advantages are is the fact that you can have retries on failure. It also supports exponential backoffs or any type of backoff and has a time to lift that you can declare. We're going to take a look at this in a second. Also, the pitfall is that obviously, if you don't use these Helm hooks, it's not going to block the deployment. So you need to orchestrate it. That's that's the pitfall. But in most cases, if you are using jobs, then you can also easily integrate a Helm inside it. So what is a Helm? What we're talking about Helm is basically this solution and it's kind of a package manager for Kubernetes, but it can also do a lot of interesting stuff. Now let's go back to our board, or actually I would say, let's go back to our code and see what it's gonna look like. So KDS job demo. So we're gonna see that our job YAML, now it doesn't say pod, it explicitly says a job. And we're then going to start this container for migration. So it's gonna say, npm run migrate. But the cool thing here, thing here is that we have a, a back off limit, meaning this is the number of retries before cons the, the job has is considered failed. And also we can adjust a lot of timings. So for example, we can add a TTL, so time to live, we can also say 10 minutes until the job will be terminated. So for example, if you have a long running task, at least you can say to wait for it finished for 10 minutes. Okay, this is a bit more declarative or explicit than init containers. And as I said, Helm is probably a better way of dealing with prehooks. So Helm has a bit of a different syntax, meaning you have a notation of charts and so on. If you want, just let me in the comments below and I will cover it in the next video. But, but what you need to know is you can also have a job and it actually looks very similar to the KNS k8s kubernetes syntax and uh, the only thing is that you can also declare values that you can later read here as you can see it's quite simple values basically referring to this values.yaml and you can read some uh, interpolated values cool thing here is that you can have annotations and in the annotations you're going to say pre-install pre-upgrade meaning before our deployment is installed we're going to run this job and our deployment which is living here is not going to run before our job is finished. As simple as that. So guys, if you like this video, you're probably going to like my system design and architecture playlist as well. Pick one video that you don't know about and let me know in the comments below if you like the video. If so, smash like and subscribe for more interesting videos like this. I'm going to see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.